this movement, we're gonna do a closed grip lap pull down. What we're targeting here is for a warm up. So we're really looking to warm up and activate our lower lat insert. So right in here. So what you're gonna notice is when he's going to pull this down, he looks up. And then when he lets it up, he looks forward. So right in there, it's gonna feel right in here. Yep, that's really good. And then he lets his head forward like you're looking through a window. Get it deeper down. One. One more. Down. The next movement that we're gonna do for our warm up is going to be a stretcher. These are like classic John Meadows. Stretchers are really good if you're having tightness in your upper traps or even shoulders. Lower traps are not a common muscle group to hit. So in this movement, it's just another way to make sure that we're not developing weak points or even injuring our shoulders. So we're gonna open up doing a stretcher. So what you're gonna notice here is Kirk is actually using this padding to put his foot against the plant. He's leaning slightly forward, and when he pulls down again, he's gonna look up. Just stay right here, and he's gonna be targeting his lower, lap, lower traps. And on these, you don't wanna go heavy. It's really just for that stretch. So he's letting it all out, letting everything stretch. Good. On to the next, we're going to be doing a, the machine's open, we're ready to rock and roll. So this is one of my favorite back movements. This is a hammer low row. When you're doing a hammer low row, when you're doing two hands at a time, it's probably about 50% harder than doing a unilateral. I usually like warming up and using both arms at the same time in the beginning. And the major reason is because it's gonna stretch your entire back forward. So he's letting it stretch completely forward and then he's pulling it back. Notice when he pulls it back at the top of the movement, he's lifting his chest up slightly. This is gonna allow for a better contraction. He's able to get into his lower lats yet again, but it's mainly just gonna be the meat of the lat right here. But that stretch is really what's gonna grow a great back. So how often do I have a men's physique athlete trained back? It's gonna be one to two days a week. If not, he's gonna have at least some type of stretching volume in if it's only one day a week. For the most part, it's gonna be two days a week though. For classic, it's a little bit different because if you need to bring up your legs, it's going to be two, sometimes two and a half days a week of legs. And then that two and a half day a week of legs is going to be a back and a leg day, depending on if they have to bring up the posterior chain or anterior chain. My quads are already squeezing against my shorts at Nationals, so super excited for that. Everyone should just have a balanced look in bodybuilding regardless, so. What do you think about the new weight change for pros? Um, I like it overall. It won't be too much of an effect for myself um, with like my leg difference and whatnot, but like I think it's a good move in the right direction for the sport. Just so we, each division has its own particular look that it has, and I feel like that'll help keep men's physique within that particular look for the sport that it was like originally made to be, you know? As some contributing points, Kirk was talking about it actually being a look. Men's physique is a look. And that's a very hard concept for some people to get because they try to look at like the fine lines, like the division says X, Y, and Z. But at the end of the day, it's a look. Even in classic, it's a look. It's not just bodybuilding. It's overall structure, appearance, your facial expression. It's a look. And it's hard to put your finger on it, but when you see the look, you know the look. Yeah, for sure. Even thinking about like waist size and different things like that, and how your like joints, if you have smaller joints, a smaller waist, that's gonna add and accentuate how big and how like, and even in like even um, having your shoulders, wide shoulders up top, super small waist gonna accentuate how big you actually look and then that taper is gonna really get to that look of almost like a upside down Dorito. You kinda wanna have in Vince Vizzi, so. <laughs> so we're gonna call the division Becoming the Dorito. Ent yeah, yeah. Wait, wait, en enter the Dorito. Enter the Enter the Dorito. Enter the Dorito. <laughs> Kirk's always out angling. Look at this dude. Kirk is an NFL linebacker, so it's all good. Did you have a football background? Mainly wrestling. I, I played football, but I wrestled up through high school. Was gonna. I had some like different like smaller D2 and three schools um, want me to come wrestle, but ended up just pursuing my education more. So this wasn't really worth it. And I got into bodybuilding at that time, and so I was more focused on that and weight training. And it seems like it's panned out so far. <laughs> So I 
get better contraction at the top. That's why I was talking about it. You didn't hear it then. I lift my chest at the top to make sure I get a harder contraction. Drive your elbows back all the way, all the way, all the way. Drive, drive, drive. Drive your elbows back further. You can drive it back further. Drag it towards the ground as hard. There you go, good. More range of motion, come on. I want you to contract all the way back. Contract, contract. Further, further. You're only getting about like a two inch range of motion out of it. So right now where you're going is you're basically right in here and you're going like this right here instead of I feel like I need to pull up the, the thing with this when I typically hit this I'm trying to hit my like traps and like you want me to hit more lats with this yes and so I'm trying to pull down and if I can track my lats this is like far as it goes versus if I'm coming up then I feel like I can like get my elbows so back that's just what you're used to training, right? So I want you to go pull through your lower lat, through the majority of your lat, instead of your upper lat. So your upper lat, if you're pulling it higher, it's gonna hit more upper lat. Yeah. I wanna hit literally the meat of the lat, the middle of the lat. Okay. So the middle of the lat and the lower lat, which is our weak point that we need to work on anyways, because you're so strong through your other parts that you're compensating, right? So you have amazing traps, like your traps are really, really good. From top to bottom, like all the way down through records and everything. But we still need to fill in the outside a little bit more to get the density there. So I don't want you focusing on your traps, I want you focus on your lats. So let's drop the weight down, let's make sure that you get a feel for it, the height and everything. And then we're gonna go start up from the ground up and build up from there. So you're still lift, so you're lifting your chest up, but you're not pulling back of the arms. So pull it back of the arms right here. Pull. Good. There you go. Good. Now let it out. That's much better. Dude, but now I'm like not engaging my lats. Right. Like I, I saw that. Because you're rolling up. Yeah, because it's like going straight through my traps now, like up here. Versus like coming through. Like if I come like this more so, now I feel it like through my lats a lot more. So then you have to drive your elbows back further though. So if you bring your chest back. I feel like I have to bring my chest up to See, but you, your arms aren't even bending though. This is why people develop weak points and they keep developing weak, and the weak points never change, yeah. is because it's frustrating when we can't lift a certain weight or be strong like we are if we manipulate that movement. Because we're still doing the movement and there's nothing wrong with it. It's just, you're predominantly using other muscle groups that are already strong and those muscle groups just getting stronger and stronger because those weak points look weaker and weaker. Yeah. But if you take the time over the next like month, two months, and what you're gonna notice is even if you manipulate that movement back into how you're originally doing it, you'd be so much stronger through the movement because those weak points are now getting developed. So, and you're probably not gonna go back to it because your lats are stronger than your, well, your traps are a really strong muscle group, but your lower traps are not as strong as your lats should be, in theory, because your lat is one of the strongest movement, or your lats are one of the strongest muscle groups. But we'll take it slow. Why don't you do one more set here? Just get a feel for it, make sure it feels good. You don't have to get that many reps. Just get enough reps where you get a mind to muscle connection and then we'll go up from there. There you go, good. And by the way, it is harder to do this when you're leaning all the way in like this. I actually like it better, it's a better stretch. So, and Kirk's getting really good activations right through the meat of the lats now. Like all through, so it's no longer his traps, it's now on his lats. That's really good, dude. All right, you can rack it, that's good. A substitution for the movement is an incline dumbbell supported row. It's actually one of my favorite movements. You can manipulate that movement to pretty much target anywhere in the lats. Very similar to this. You can target your upper lat here, you can target your lower lat here, you can target just a straight up middle meat of the lat if you want to, um, or you can do all three. That's one reason why I love this machine. That's why there's one reason why I love dumbbells as well. We'll probably do dumbbells today just so I can help you with form manipulation. And I guarantee you when you're doing dumbbells, you're either rowing it high or you're rowing it through the lat, like you're lifting your chest and hitting your trap. I hit my Very trap similar. unless I go super, unless I'm like literally here. I'm Row it. Yup, exactly. You're, you're like, like a yeah. lawnmower almost, yeah, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. You should call it the lawnmower. If you're going to the Olympia stage anyways, you really want to see where you line up because you want to see where your weak points are against some of these other guys. Not that you're comparing yourself to other guys. It's all about being 
the best of yourself. But what, one thing that's very important is to make sure that you're lining up and you can be compared against the best in the world also. It's my job, I've been traveling a lot recently and it has been a little bit more difficult, but usually we kind of have time frames when we travel a little bit more than others. And so we're kind of working around that. But once I get locked in to prep too, like my job is somewhat flexible. Like I let them know like, hey, like I need to lock in during this time and they can be able to accommodate and I can work from home some days, which makes things a little bit easier as well. But I'm just gonna block my calendar and be like, hey, I need this week off. Like. That's what it is, you know, so. Guys have been training so many years doing something and developing weak points and you just compensate because are you doing a lap movement? Absolutely, you're still doing a lap movement. You're still rowing it. You're getting it through yeah. your range of motion. But is it the right range of motion yeah. for what you're trying to accomplish? And that's the difference. And I honestly hate talking about biomechanics because everyone like tries to be so surgical within, try to do mathematical formulas and all this stuff. Yeah. At the end of the day, it's like, do you feel the muscle that you're trying to hit? Yeah. And if the answer is no, it needs to be changed. Well, for me, even on this machine, I always use this to hit traps instead of lats. It was never a lat focus. So to even like switch to that, to use the machine for that, has been like the biggest change because like I've never targeted for that. So my whole like, my mind muscle connection, even when I'm just going through that movement, it's always just trap focus. So that's why it was like so difficult and frustrating for me to like convert over to like hit my lats through the same movement. Yeah, and there's, traps are actually relatively easy muscle group to hit. You have a shrug, maybe a rack pull or a deadlift, like yoking movements essentially. And then you, the only thing that you have for lower lat is pretty much a stretcher, mm -hmm. which you can use that for a lower lat movement for sure. I just think that the stretcher is probably a predominantly better movement for it. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I mean, it's frustrating when you have to change up your form and kind of take that step back. I think it's fun now. As I've gotten older and I've taken my ego less out of the gym, yeah. it's been more fun for me to figure out certain things and how can I accomplish more out of doing less and that sounds like super lazy but i'm a really hard worker yeah but i'm going to accomplish more out of less and then i'm going to see if i can beat my numbers making it harder and doing it the right way exactly nice good drive your elbows back a little bit further good there you go now you're peaking the muscle good You have, you still, even even though you haven't felt that before, the crazy thing is, you still want to go through your upper lats and your traps, even trying to train like that, which is crazy. Yeah. You're just so used to training like that. And I can see it literally, like your body literally, immediately, it wants to shift into the upper lats, yeah, into the yeah. lower. It does, so. for sure. It's like I'm focusing so hard to keep it in <laughs> that part of the muscle. And I've never felt my lat in that way before. Cause like, when you're hitting like the, almost like the lawnmower type that we talked about earlier, you feel it more in kind of the outside and you kind of get your terries and stuff kind of involved with it too. But like, I've never felt that middle part of like my lat right in the meat like that before until like now. So it's just crazy. Cause it's like, I've been training since I was like 13. So like several years at this point and just like never even felt that part of the muscle. You, know? you mean a decade at this point? Yeah, exactly. Like a decade. <laughs> several like, years. Yeah, no, like a decade at this point and never felt that part of my back. Like, like my muscle connection, like freaking just firing through there like that before ever, so. Yeah. And to take the, again, taking the ego out of it, he's actually going to be sticking with this weight today. He's not going up from here, which is very low for him for sure. However, what we're gonna do to increase his weight is we're going to go to unilateral. So we're gonna do bilateral, three working sets, four working sets maximum, probably three today. And then we're going to go immediately into unilaterals for two sets which a unilateral movement on this, it's literally like 30 to 50% easier. So we can actually go up and wait from here and he'll be able to still target his lats. But I guarantee that we see him trying to compensate and taking his muscles off the lats again and putting them onto the traps or the upper lat instead of the middle and bottom of the lat. No, because it is really humbling because like, when I would do this before, I'd have four or five plates on this and just like cranking it out, you know, like when I would be ego lifting and not focusing on the right part of the muscle. So now that I'm doing this, it is very humbling just to go back down to two plates, but I've never felt my lats so engaged like that before. So don't be an ego lifter. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's like a really humbling thing too, is like 
you know that you can be an animal and get through that next rep if you wanted to, mm -hmm. even though you already failed out. Yeah. Because like my actual muscle failed. Like it was already done, that's why I hit the trap. Yeah. So it's like putting down the weight, that was true failure technically. Yeah. The, my muscle that I was trying to hit failed or B, I, my mind wasn't strong enough to keep it on the muscle anymore. Yeah. One and two, which I will help mental fatigue usually before physical fatigue. Yeah. That makes sense. So most people can't even hit. I feel like, yeah, I feel like a lot of people do. Because then it's like, you're, it's like you're so used to your body's like natural pattern and what it wants to do. And it's hard to like stay so focused and locked in all that. Especially when it starts to get heavy and you're just used to just going back to like what feels easier. So my hardest thing when I used to travel was actually mental fatigue. Physical fatigue, I could always push through like physical limitations, but the mental fatigue, when you mentally aren't there, your form breaks down and you end up getting injured. Yeah. It might not be that you're actually physically failing out from being tired. It could be that your mind's not there keeping you on target for hitting the muscle group properly. Yeah, yeah. So that's why I always try to segment or do breathing habits before I do my next movement so you can space out anything outside of the gym you segment that part out segment what's in the gym and you look at what's right in front of you a lot of times when i'm doing like bent over rows and things like that i have to have a dumbbell because like my limb difference is about seven inches and so i have to have to get a, I have to get a dumbbell and i put that or like some type of like platform i can stand on to be able to balance myself if i'm doing like bent over row with the barbell dumbbell whatever it is so it does make some things a little bit more harder because i have to a little bit more difficult because I have to stabilize myself with that and so things like deadlift I can't do and so like I have to get more what's the word um, a little bit more kind of creative within my training so I can be able to hit those and, and kind of hit those target those same exact muscle groups that everyone else can hit by doing like a conventional deadlift or like rack pulls things like that things like right now that we talked about a little bit early like having my pulling my using my lats through that movement one is just like recognizing like that it's ego that really comes into the play with it because at the end of the day like we're building muscle we're not power there's trying to be strong so it doesn't matter how strong i am in the gym but everyone likes to like throw around some plates and stuff like that so it's really just getting over that and realizing the bigger picture is to target that muscle group that you need to bring up which is like a weaker point in myself because it's like i want to be competitive and win so that's kind of how I push my mind through it. Just really take a step back and look at the bigger picture. Yeah, I guess advice I give to younger athletes is that it takes time. Like this is not an overnight process. Like, I've been training, I'm 25 and I've been training for over a decade. Um, like this doesn't happen overnight. Like people are like, oh, you're so young. Like you must be a hyper responder. You grow really fast. And that's just not the case. Obviously I have probably better than average genetics because I'm a pro and whatnot, but like it's been years and years in the making to do this and so really just telling them to keep with it and it just happens over time like unless you put in a decade like five to ten years at least you don't even know what type of physique you have because you just haven't put in the time yet so just stick with it good drag the elbow back there you go much better yeah no it just depends on what type of um setup it is because sometimes there's just like a straight flat pad and so then i do have to use my core and just stabilize myself but with this one since it's like this i'll put this foot here and then i'll put this foot over on this side so that i'm like still able to just like balance here so that's just how i normally will be able to do this the only problem with that is that when i'm trying to go forward is like range of motion sometimes may like get hit depending on what the depending on what the machine is like so um with this one we'll try it out and see but i may just need to come back and come here and then i just literally just have to balance but i'll put my foot a little bit towards the middle of it so then i can still be steady which i may have to do on this one just because the range of motion usually like there's more separation as well some of them there'll be more separation with this because here i don't know if i'm like it's like i'm already i'm like been i'm like stretched some but i'm not getting a full like i'm not getting a full stretch out of this unless it's like I don't know. Unless it's like here is fine, but I feel like I'm not able to get a full stretch because then I'm like running into this. You know what I'm saying? Back so far. Much That's it. Yeah. Don't lean back. Good. Drive it into your stern. Yup. Without leaning back. Good. Into your stern. So 
the misconception on lap pull downs, rows, the whole nine is a lot of people lean back when they go to do the movement. When you lean back, it's only erectors. So for instance, if you're doing a back double bicep, the cue is don't lean back because it flattens out your whole back. You actually lift your chest up. When you lift your chest up, it activates your whole back. So earlier when Kirk was warming up with me, he was leaning back too much and on his lap pull down. All you do is when you look, if you look up, it actually opens up your chest automatically. So that's just an easy cue to use. This movement right here, my life mentor literally forced me to sit upright and to drive it into my sternum. One of the most frustrating lifting experiences of my life. And you know what happened? My back grew. <laughs> the old and the wise. Yeah. <laughs> with, with great age comes great responsibility. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Spider-Man, you had it wrong. Yeah. <laughs> Touch your sternum. You got this. Come on. Get it back. You got the range of motion. I feel the range of motion in there. Good. Good, come on. Drop it. Back. It's frustrating, I know. Dude, it just won't, it won't go, man. Well, it would go. Like once I started pulling it, it, you were getting contraction all the way back. Yeah. It just, you haven't, you, that muscle group has probably been neglected for the last, not decade, but the majority of the decade. Yeah a training and I was almost half a decade in before I started correcting my range of motion on back in particular. Even people with really good backs sometimes have issues with activation and I've seen it 80 to 90% of the time which is actually kind of insane. Even I had a really good back before I actually learned how to train my back properly and the major reason is is when you're really strong and you get away with lifting super heavy movements on yoking movements in particular and you yoke it the stretch is probably going to grow your back to an extent, but to get those peaks and hills and valleys and the muscles that you're really trying to develop over time, which takes time, you need to make sure that you're contracting the muscle completely. You also have to be cautious of people's space, right? So that's probably the hardest thing for me as well is when I'm recording in public, making sure that people are comfortable with me recording and making sure that they know that they're not going to be in the video okay. or that I'm like memeing on them, right? Yeah. A lot of people do really ignorant things where they meme on people and they post it to YouTube and they make other people look bad. I don't like any of that. So I make sure to reiterate that I'm not getting anyone in the footage. If you don't want to be in the footage, we'll make sure to edit you out. Okay. If someone has an issue with it, right? The weirdest thing is when people approach you though yeah. and they like tr roast you straight to your face. You're like, oh, any anything for three seconds of fame. I'm like, I, I'm just like, I don't respond. Why? Because they're clearly at a worse position in their life than you are. So that's their insecurity projecting outwards. So I wouldn't worry about other people just in general in life. Just make sure that if people are uncomfortable getting on the footage, just be like, look, you're not gonna be on the film, I promise you. And they're like, oh, okay, thank you. And that's it. Because unfortunately, a lot of people make people look really bad on the internet a lot of times. You have people at Walmart and all that stuff. So that is, yeah. I did it in Costco one time. You'll like this one. So this one was a little bit hard for me because Costco, it was like during mainstream hours. So it was just slammed. I showed up to Costco. The manager actually walked up to me and talked to me. They were, they were probably gonna ask me to leave, but I was like, I promise you, I'm not getting anyone in here. I don't want anyone in my video. It's just supposed to be me saying how to save money on, in Costco, right? And it's grocery shopping. So I wouldn't let, let it really get to you. I'll just be respectful of others more so than anything. Yeah. It's easy. There you go, bro. Come on. Good. Good, now you're working, come on. Good. Good. Nice. Oh, come on. 
Woo! Good. Come on. Good. One drop set. Go. Pull it back. Good. Good form. Control it. Good. Drop. Go. Keep it right in here. Keep it right in here. He has so much blood filling right now, you can see his skin turning red in the area. Look at that. He, he literally has red. Like his skin is literally turning red with the blood in the area. So we're closing out with pull-ups. I just did one set of pull-ups. It wasn't the prettiest set of pull-ups I've ever done. I got a few. I can do assisted pull-ups now to make sure my contractions are good. Really, I like ending with pull-ups because of the stretch. You either start with pull-ups or you end with pull-ups. So both are great ways to start or end the workout. However, I do like assisted pull-ups. Whatever is your natural rhythm is what you should focus on. I do really like holding a stretch at the bottom though, since that's really predominantly what we're going for during a pull-up. Pull it tighter into your body and pronate more. Pr wrist in more. Good. You should feel a harder contraction. Good. The more you supinate to open it up more, the harder you contract the muscle in. So Kirk right now has a really hard time supinating his wrist. So supination is kind of like holding a bowl of soup, right? That's the easiest way to remember it. <laughs> so the more you can, the more you can supinate or turn the wrist inward, the harder you can contract and peak your bicep. That was one of my major limiting factors for not being able to grow my biceps for such a long time. So Kirk is having a really hard time supinating his wrist. Another really important thing to do is you back down off the weight to give your body the ability to build up the auxiliary muscles and to actually work on the flexibility during that period of time. You'll eventually be able to supinate further and further. And once you can do it at that weight, then you can start working your way back up. But it does take time to build up. Not a lot of time, usually it's about like one to two months, but it, you take a step back to take a leap forward. Sometimes during bicep curls, what you'll notice is people actually take their wrist and they, they curl it into themselves because they think they're getting more biceps. It's really just working your form at that point. So the whole key is that turn the wrist, but you never want to curl the wrist in. You keep it neutral so that your pivot point's right here. So once you start curling in, you're gonna take tension off the bicep to a degree. Whenever I'm targeting forearms, I'm most strictly targeting forearms. So it'll be like a hammer curl. When I'm doing a hammer curl, I'm specifically targeting right in here. Another thing you can do to take your forearm or another muscle group out of the movement is you actually fatigue out that muscle group before going into your next movement. So you can do your hammer curls first, fatigue out your forearms, and then you could do your normal dumbbell curls afterwards. And your forearms are fatigued out, so you should get more tension on your biceps. We're dropping weight. We're dropping weight, Kirk. Even if your forearms are tighter, it doesn't give it a lighter weight. Try that. See, that's much easier to do now. Good. All right, now I'm gonna supinate this for you. You ready? Dude, I, I can't even hold the dumbbell. I know. See, that's much better. Much better though. And then the other cue is you want to keep that as tight into your body as you can. So you almost want to curl it in front of the chest slightly. It's like 
Like the inside of the dumbbell should end inside of the chest almost. Like, yeah, there you go, right there. Should be contracting a lot harder right now. Good. A lot of people when they're curling, they curl and they end up to the outside of the body, right? So like they end up out here. If you think about with throwing an uppercut, right? How do you throw an uppercut? Why would you ever throw an uppercut out here? You throw an uppercut right here because this is where you're strong. So the same thing with the curl, you're technically curling through like an uppercut, right? And also if you think about it like an uppercut, when you uppercut, you actually throw back, right? When you actually throw your chest up like this, it rolls your shoulder back and it actually forces you to use your bicep. So you can basically dip the body. When you dip the body, it rolls the shoulder back and then you curl, supinate, in. And it ends, the inside of the dumbbell ends like almost in the inside of the chest, like almost to the nipple line. Before I started working with John Meadows, this is actually a funny story. I warned him that I'd probably be the athlete that he's ever had that has eaten the most food he's ever had. And obviously he's trained plenty of people over the 30 plus years that he was coaching. 30 plus years? <clears throat> well, sure enough, we were like getting deeper in the off season and he's giving me more and more food. And I'm actually recovering from a surgery at this point and I slowly started incorporating some upper body because it was a shoulder surgery. Sure enough, my calories started cusping over 6,500 calories. When I was over 6,500 calories, my weight actually wasn't going up, I was just getting harder, bigger, leaner. <clears throat> well, for some reason I was on a pizza kick, which I usually never was, and I'd have one full pizza a week. And eventually I was doing two full pizzas a week. I wasn't putting on any weight and I was getting harder and leaner. And John goes, I'm not comfortable giving you any more food. And I go, John, I just let you know I'm eating two full pizzas a week, large pizzas. He's like, oh, well, keep doing that. And then he added a milkshake in with real ice cream with the milk. So that was my off season with John. You're basically like, you dip, you dip the body and it rolls the shoulder back. So you're neutral, you dip the body. When you're curling, you curl it up and in. It's a pinwheel curl, but look how hard the bicep's contracting. And your elbow slightly goes forward, but the only reason why the elbow slightly goes forward is because you're contracting at the top a little bit further if you want to. So it's basically like multiple, multiple pieces of the movement. So when you're curling, you go from here, 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 here. And then if you want, you can go one little notch a little more. But as long as your shoulders rolled back, you can do it. So it's technically more of a pinwheel curl than like a normal dumbbell curl. Because it's like, you're technically like this, like it's like a rotational is what it is. But, but like it's a modified pinwheel curl because pinwheel curls you're technically like rounding off. I don't like the whole rounding off. I don't get that much activation out of it. So I like just a normal dumbbell curl here and then you basically twist it. You're supinated now. There's all tension right here. Curl, 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 curl. Then you can lift it up top if you want to. But you're technically ending like right here. But that's because your wrist. So I was looking at your wrist. Your wrists are so tight, dude. Like, look at this. This is just like tight. Yeah. All this is tight and bound. And that yeah. could be forearm too. It, that is forearm. This is wrist and forearm. But like, all this is bound on him. And I was, and the right side's bound even more than the left side. That's why I actually leaned into the bench last time because I want to look at that. So what he's doing with his wrist is he's actually opening up his wrist down because his forearms are literally so tight. I used to do the same thing, by the way. 